Thank you very much indeed for having me here in Mexico. It was um, 20 years ago on this date that I first came to Mexico. And um, in that period, I had a job. I was watching the news this morning on CNN, and I seen one of Carnival's ships had gone aground. My first job in California all the way down to Mexico, was actually working on one of Carnival's vessels there. And um, I was just thinking back, my first patient that I've seen in Mexico, even though I've seen many, many patients, obviously, on the cruise liner, was on, on one of the little casitas of the um, town of Puerto Vallarta. And one of the galley stewards, Jose Martinez, asked me to see his mother and it was a time, I suppose, when a lot of the old traditions in Mexico were still there, uh, as they were in Ireland. And he told his mother that the Mexican doctors um, weren't diagnosing her properly, and, and that I could. And he brought me into a little room, and while I was examining her, he put a ball of hair in my hand. So he set me up and she started shouting empacho, empacho, I remember. And um, she was of the generation who believed that you could block your stomach with a hairball. And he, he made a fool out of me because he made me show her the hairball, that sort of, and then she got better. So it was all those years ago, 20 years ago. So here today I'm going to talk about making patients look younger, but by doing this in such a way that they can use their own mechanisms of regeneration. We have spent, I suppose, the last 10 years injecting things into people's faces, often that have caused a lot of problems. Most of the hyaluronic acids are, are fine. And we know that once we start playing around with them to make them last longer, we can cause granulomas. And I, I suppose, started looking at different ways of doing this because we do a lot of laser resurfacing. I've done maybe about 4,000 cases. And one of the problems with laser resurfacing is that even though it is fantastic on the upper face, it isn't as good on the lower face. It doesn't tend to give a lot of volume, and it doesn't necessarily make people look younger. I came up with a method. It's difficult to say that it's a new method. And all I'm doing, I suppose, is using techniques that are there already and using them in a scientific way. And this has won a, a, some awards in Europe, in London, and another in Paris recently. And I suppose we age in two ways. We age, number one, by photoaging. And photoaging is the sort of damage you would get a lot in Mexico, but not as much in Ireland. And that's secondary to prolonged ultraviolet exposure. And we know also that somebody who's been in the sun a long time, will tend to get a lot of rain. Now the eyes, or the periorbital area, is really a barometer of a patient's chronological and environmental history. So we take any patient, when we bring them into our consultation rooms, if you look at the eyes, the eyes can tell a lot metaphysically in terms of the soul, but they also can tell the doctor an awful lot about the patient's exposure, particularly Dr. Violet Light. The sort of problems, certainly, that ultraviolet light causes is increase in pigmentation, fine writers or wrinkles, coarse wrinkles, skin cancer, thread veins because of solar elastosis, and sallow skin. Chronological aging is that type of aging that we get just by getting older. We all know that we look older when we're 40 than we are when we're 20, and this has a lot to do with the telomeres on our DNA. So we all have a biological clock ticking. Some of us hope to reach to 90, others will only reach 70, and others due to heart attacks or road traffic accidents may not even make those years. And the sort of things that chronological aging causes around the eye are protrusion of the infraorbital fat pad, skin laxity, again wrinkles, we have more wrinkles as we get older, even though a patient who's 
40 in Queensland and Australia probably will have more wrinkles than a 80-year-old in Dublin because of ultraviolet light. But I'm not totally for the use of sunscreen to block ultraviolet light. Particularly in Ireland, all our patients have gone a bit mad because everybody's using suntan lotion and often the dermatologists tell them to do this. We get very little sun compared to Mexico and our babies are born with vitamin D deficiencies. 78% of all patients or babies that are born in Dublin hospitals are vitamin D deficient. 48% of all doctors are vitamin D deficient. 87% of all the patients in our nursing homes are vitamin D deficient. And the government as yet, on lack of Australia or Canada, hasn't put vitamin D into our food. Now, in terms of treating facial aging, we have a lot of different methods. And we can use derma rollers, radio frequency. We can use, um, I suppose, I myself favor CO2 fractionalized resurfacing. Uh, in many ways, um, I like this because it gives immediate results. It um, probably still is the single best method of making the periorbital area look younger. One of the problems originally, I suppose, with CO2 resurfacing is that it used to give rise to a lot of problems in terms of hypopigmentation or delayed healing. These have practically gone now with the new fractionalized resurfacing methods. And in terms of laser resurfacing itself, I suppose I grew up on originally the old CO2 lasers 15 years ago, moved through the Airbnb eyes, moved through radio frequency, which wasn't particularly good, and looked at CO2 in its new form since 2006 fractionalized. And this will be the normal patient that comes in to you, and you can immediately see she has things like hooding of her upper eyelid, She's got lateral brow ptosis, and I normally, with all these patients, use Botox to start off. Botox and laser resurfacing really goes hand in hand. If you Botox the patient beforehand, it's almost like taking a shirt and ironing it. Um, if you flatten the shirt, you'll get a better result. It's the same thing with laser resurfacing. And the second thing, of course, that Botox does is that it can um, preserve the effect. This would be a normal patient that we would do with CO2 resurfacing, and you can see between the first and the third pictures that um, there's quite a good effect in terms of the eye opening out wider, the fat pad beginning to disappear, and the wrinkles disappearing as well. What I suppose laser surfacing is doing at the end of the day is forming new collagen. And once we form new collagen, we get rid of skin laxity, we get rid of fat protrusion, we get rid of wrinkles, and even the tear trough. I was chatting to some doctors yesterday who asked me would I do a little bit on CO2, so I included them this morning. And I'll go into the lift in a moment. This is a patient also, let's say, with the upper face done, with laser resurfacing. And um, picture two is after about five days. And this one here is after about a month. And this here is just, you can see actually the new collagen after about a month, this deep red stained hemolytic eosin um, part of the dermis. And one of the problems, I suppose, that I found with laser resurfacing, as I mentioned earlier, is the fact that Whenever you look at the patient afterwards, the upper part of the face is fantastic, but you'd really feel like taking out some derma fillers and restoring either their mid face or their lower face. So um, what I had looked at was the positive things of laser resurfacing are pigmentation, thread veins, coarse vessels, fantastic for, if, you, if you've got a patient who has got infrared fat pads, but isn't bad enough to need surgery, the technique in the skin is often enough to push them back in. You can see with this patient here, a perfect example of infraorbital fat pads and um, almost good clearance. The sort of things that it's not good for are volume loss in the face, 
A useful look secondary in the mirror fat pad being put back up into its normal area. Marionette lines and I suppose um, the laser labia lines. This is again is the sort of problem sometimes you can get with laser resurfacing in terms of a herpes outbreak. Now, what I decided to do was introduce a new method and I'm calling it the Dublin method only because the different parts of it happen to fit the acronym of the city of Dublin, but I could have easily changed it and called it Berlin and used R for radio frequency. So I suppose what I'm trying to get across in many ways is we have all these things in our own clinic. The patient brings their own blood to you to use as blood groups for PRP. Derma rollers only cost like a euro and you don't even have to use the laser if you didn't want to. Omnilux Red 633 light is very inexpensive also. So here is an immediate new treatment you can use in all your patients that works. And um, I have patients running 9 to 12 months now. The D is for derma roller. The U is ultra um, pulse laser. Now you don't really have to use the laser. It's just because I started from the laser that I decided to see could I make the laser better. B is the blood factors. Li is light. And don't underestimate for a moment the power of 633 light. It really is a magical wavelength. I suppose a lot of doctors know it already from treating basal cell cancers and from photodynamic therapy. But I'll show you in a moment some videos of fibroblasts actually moving with that light. Fibroblasts, as you know, are the workhorses of all the cells. This, these are the cells that will synthesize the new collagen in the body. And they have a critical root role in wound healing and all the things we're doing to the skin in order to make it regenerate is of course we're wounding the skin. It's the same thing as if you watch your child fall off a bicycle and cut their hand or their head. We're using this process in order to make the body heal itself. So by using derma rollers we're just wounding the dermis in order to form new collagen and really in a way that's half of what lasers are doing also. Now, these are fibroblasts, so... And what we want to do with fibroblasts, of course, is to have lots of them in the body. Because if you just do PRP on its own, you're just going to have a lot of bosses telling fibroblasts what to do, but if you don't have the fibroblasts there to do it, you're not going to get as good of an effect. If you do PRP on its own, and it just inject into the skin, it lasts for about two or three months. If you do a derma roller before it, do PRP on exactly the same day, it will last six months. And I suppose in some ways that's common sense. And um, these are very interesting cells. You can see that um, they're often actually double cells. They've got pseudopods that can move around the body. And we can use this ability of them being motile and moving around the body to get a better effect.